Hello everyone and welcome to this free context talk. Today we are going to explore together the theater of Nero that recently resurfaced from the belly of Rome. I am Lydia Galante, a uh, native Roman, Italian by birth, archaeologist by education. And I have a specialty in ancient Roman topography, which means I try to understand the transformations uh, the ancient cities went through the different stages of uh, their history. And this is quite useful here because uh, we are going to explore a site that is very close to a quite famous site you can see. You can easily recognize the Basilica of St. Peter, so with its magnificent square. In front of the square there is a boulevard. We are in the heart of the ancient city and uh, flanking the boulevard there is a Renaissance palace that was uh, investigated uh, since uh, 2020. And uh, what was discovered uh, under the courtyard of uh, the palazzo is quite fascinating. A team of skilled archaeologists coordinated by Dr. Marzia Di Mento, that you can see here, carefully studied what started to resurface from the ground. And that was resur what re that, what, that resurfaced was truly extraordinary. You can see how careful they needed to go because the frescoes reemerged and the precious uh, columns that very lightly adorned the uh, wall uh, behind the stage, the columns that were imported, so very precious materials, and also fine build finely built wall, uh, walls, uh, and every piece was uh, carefully studied. Not only ancient Roman, because these, uh, these are medieval crafts, uh, fascinating because uh, the entire site recount a history that last, uh, lasted 13 centuries that we are going uh, to explore together. So I will start with a brief uh, introduction, putting the place uh, in the context using also some ancient sources uh, who talked about the theater of Nero and uh, trying to understand what went on throughout the century, 10th centuries in this site. So let's get started with the place. I have already introduced you uh, into where we are located. The Basilica of St. Peter's is here. This is the area of the Vatican Museums. In the foreground, the magnificent Vatican Gardens, but all around the area is a pretty build up. I told you that the Renaissance Palazzo we are going to explore is located in front of the Basilica, so right here. And this is how the Vatican appears today in 2023. But 2000 years ago, the area was very different. Here you would find many lavish estates that belonged to aristocrats, and one of the finest of these estates was the one belonging to Agrippina the Elder, who was the uh, mother of the future Emperor Caligula. When Emperor Caligula inherited the estate, he wanted to add into this magnificent park a circus. A circus was a space where, in the Roman times, chariot races went on. So you see like the Circus Maximus next to the Palatine Hill. In the center of the circus there stood a huge pillar, an obelisk imported from Egypt that might be familiar to most of you because the obelisk was moved in the center of the square in front of the Basilica of St. Peter's in 1586. But the circus that was used for the entertainment was also used for capital executions. And this is a sad story that connects us with the successor of um, one of the successors of Caligula, Emperor Nero. Well, 
it happened a disaster. On uh, the night uh, between uh, the 18th and the 19th July, 64 AD, a disastrous fire destroyed the city of Rome, and Nero was uh, blamed to having put on the fire, even if uh, the historian uh, Tacitus uh, says that it is uh, not uh, really clear if uh, it was due to the chance or to the malice of the sovereign. As a matter of fact, Nero needed a scapegoat because uh, the rumors against him started to be too loud. And therefore Nero accused the Christians, who in the beginning of the Christian era were not considered good people. And therefore they were burned on uh, the stacks uh, like human torches, but among those who were executed, there was also the Apostle Peter, here depicted by two great artists of the past, Giotto and Michelangelo, upside down. And this explains why, beside the historians, Nero was blamed to be the Antichrist, or Lucifer, Satan, the worst of all the emperors, labeled as so by Christian apologists. With this, I don't, I don't want to say that he was a good person. He was not as good as many other of his colleagues. Anyway, near the circus, Nero, who was in a state, who loved Greece and Greek arts, he built a theater that was located very close to the circus. So this huge park had many places for entertainment. But... Soon after the death of Nero, the circus, uh, the circus as well as uh, uh, the theater disappeared under layers brought in by the river floods, but also foundations of other buildings. And this is uh, the re most recent story, is the one of Palazzo della Rovere. I was uh, telling you about the boulevard in front of uh, St. Peter's Basilica. Palazzo della Rovere, built by a, a very important architect, Baccio Pontelli, one of the builders of the Sistine Chapel, was in fact uh, built on behalf of a member of the family of the Pope, Sixus IV, who actually built the Sistine Chapel. And the interior, in fact, involved one of the great artists, who worked for the popes in the past, such as Pinturicchio. If you will visit the Vatican museums, the apartment Borgia was painted by this brilliant painter with whom I cooperated also Raphael. But what happens? The uh, palazzo, as all the Renaissance palazzo, was articulated around an inner courtyard, part occupied by a parking area, but part lent by the uh, Knights of the Holy Sepulchre to a, um, a, an hotel chain uh, called uh, Four Seasons Hotel. And the chain decided to bring in major renovations. And this is uh, the layout of the future courtyard. But uh, to create this, given this is an historical palazzo, the chain needed to call the archaeological superintendency of Rome. And so, before the works started, archaeologists revealed this under the courtyard, the theater of Nero. But how can we be so sure that this is the theater of Nero? Who talks about the theater? We need to uh, read ancient authors. And actually, the first and only who... Uh, quotes uh, literally the theater, is Pliny the Elder. Pliny was a scholar and historian of the first century AD. And Pliny complained about the extreme luxury of the time of Nero. He called that luxuria. And to explain the opulence in which uh, Nero lived, 
he recounts that Nero became very fond of a collection of precious vessels that belonged to a member of the, uh, um, a, a person of consular rank, so a member of the, uh, the politi uh, uh, a politician. And this person owned a collection of vasa murrina or murrina vasa, extremely, extremely expensive. So Nero expropriated uh, all uh, the collection to the heirs of the consul and he put this on display where? In uh, the gardens, in the theater, in the whole theater that was in the gardens beyond the Tiber River. And he tells that this theater was large enough for uh, the eventual audience that attended when Nero rehearsed his musical performances before he uh, uh, appeared in the larger stage of the theatre of Pompey in the Campus Martius. So this is the main source referring to a theatre. Then we have two other historians, Suetonius and Tacitus, who more generally talk about gardens. Here you can see Suetonius in the life of Nero, and there you see Tacitus in his annals, so that uh, uh, recount uh, that uh, he uh, was uh, actually, he appeared on the public stage singing either in his palace or in his gardens that were actually located here in the area of the of the Vatican. So I will use this Google Earth image. So we are here in this area here, and this is the, the uh, uh, overlay with the, the two buildings. So the circus and the area excavated inside of the Palazzo della Rovere. You can see here a, a focus on the excavated area. I have to tell you that today technology helps a lot uh, as archaeologists because uh, using a tool called GPR, that is a ground penetrating radar, we can survey large areas not removing the dirt. So it was uh, possible to more or less uh, figure out the extent of uh, the uh, theater, not uh, having to remove all uh, the dirt. Here you can see a detail of the part that I am going to show you in a minute. So the curb area here was the sitting area that was called cavea. In front of the cavea there was of course the stage where the actors performed and usually closing the stage there was a tall wall. This is to help your imagination to figure how a Roman theatre was, not specifically the one of Nero, but just as more or less all the ancient theatres looked the same uh, despite of the different size. So you can see the sitting area and the wall above the scenery. And let's go inside of the excavation where you can see the curved wall. This was the cavea or the wall that supported the seats and in front of it you would find this was is the uh, this is the remnant of the scene france or the wall that was behind the stage please look well here there are some columns uh, laying on the floor it is very likely that these uh, columns in precious stone imported from across the Mediterranean was, uh, were the columns that were decorating the wall of the scenery. Then, uh, looking other walls, we can tell uh, that these have a very regular and fine uh, wall facing, telling that uh, the, this wall was uh, built uh, with a great amount of resources, so investing money in it. And we can also be very precise about the time range when these walls were built because of brick stamps that were found. And you can see there is a name. Brick stamps were marked 
with the name of the owner of the factory. In this case, we have the name of Neus Domitius Affer, who is known for having possessed large brick factories. But there is another detail I would like to share with you, being a topographer. I study the walls to receive information. So we found some rooms with frescoes and a very beautiful floor in a heavenborn pattern. But this type of floors were typical of a kind of uh, utilitarian buildings or not very important rooms, unlike if we had this in our homes today. So we can imagine that this floor belonged to one of the rooms used by the actors uh, as a backstage rooms, because what resurfaced from the theater was rather magnificently opulent. Look at the beauty of this ionic capital, or a beautiful herm of a statue, or even this magnificent staccos clad with gold leaf. Not only this, not long ago, they also discovered these incised gems recounting of beautiful pillars decorated with this precious hard stones. Everything was beautiful, was opulent. This was the luxuria Pliny was criticizing so much a few years after Nero's death. And Nero's death actually was the one that brought to the end the use of the theater. And Nero, as a consummate actor, might have said, Qualis artifex pereo, what an artist die with, dies with me. Actually, he was condemned to have his memory damned, the damnatio memoriae. And immediately after the death of Nero, many of his magnificent buildings started to be repurposed or dismantled. This happened also in our theater. So throughout the uh, uh, um, ending of the uh, imperial, uh, the Roman Empire, and the beginning of the Middle Ages, the uh, memory of the theater was uh, lost since uh, a while. And in the Middle Ages, I will use this map that is uh, 1493. I am talking about already the, between the 10th and the uh, 13th century. Uh, this area of Rome did not really change much. The focus of the area was, of course, the Basilica of St. Peter's, around which a number of hostels for pilgrims, hospitals, or uh, charity institutions started to be built to welcome the different uh, population who arrived in Rome in a pilgrimage. And depending on the nationality, there were many of these different uh, associations. One was uh, the so-called Scola Saxonum, that was uh, the uh, institution that uh, took care of the pilgrims arriving from England. And this was located right in proximity of our Palazzo della Rovere. It is from here that, during the dig, resurfaced this beautiful, precious glass chalice. And imagine that since before this excavation, only seven of these chalices were known. In this excavation, seven more resurfaced. And along with this, certainly many uh, vessels as cooking wares or to uh, 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 like uh, jugs for wine and water, but also uh, materials worked in bone, telling us that beside of the charity institutions, there were also activities connected with the pilgrims. This is very interesting because it, uh, these findings allow us uh, to reconstruct a period, the 10th century, uh, of which uh, there are really few remains, uh, because uh, in that period, Rome was in a sort of economic and demographic decline. You can see here a matrix uh, for uh, to produce 
use uh, rosary beads uh, and a precious item such as a uh, comb, this was uh, a luxury item. In uh, the level above the one here from where this uh, finding resurfaced, archaeologists uh, discovered a series of roads, one on top of the other. You can see one that is uh, about uh, covering the um, an ancient uh, sewage system. And uh, there were two main roads in the area, one that from uh, the Scola Saxonum or the area of uh, uh, the uh, institution for the pilgrims reached the river and the other from the river uh, reaching the basilica. From these layers of dirt, so the most recent in uh, the dig, resurfaced precious pilgrims insignia that were uh, uh, like brooches attached uh, to the cloaks uh, identified these as uh, pilgrims like this is the precious uh, reproduction of the holy face of Luca a quite uh, venerated image that is uh, still visible today in Tuscany Luca is the northern Tuscany up of Florence and this is uh, it was made was very many times replicated and the other here is very interesting, is a, a sort of a brooch depicting Our Lady of uh, Rocamadour Roca in France. It was a, 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 a place uh, pilgrims passed through uh, in uh, the road towards uh, Santiago de Compostela. So these findings are also interesting because uh, they allow us uh, to reconstruct the uh, uh, areas uh, from where these uh, pilgrims arrived, mostly from the north, along the only safe route that survived antiquity, that was the Via Francigena. Then you see a little uh, plaque uh, depicting, it's not clear if a warrior or an angel, a, a flask depicting a, a rooster, the copy of that, it was on the belfry or bell tower of St. Peter's Basilica. And here you see uh, Dr. Alessio de Cristofaro, who, was, who is still today the responsible um, of the excavation working for the archaeological superintendency of Rome, who is uh, actually uh, uh, telling us a very interesting story, how brilliant was uh, the excavation, because this represents a virtuous example of archaeology that uh, uh, is driving, is a kind of a driving force um, to an important building renovation. So it is not a problem, not a nuisance, but it was an impulse for this renovation. Certainly, all the findings will be, will, will be very carefully restored and studied, and uh, it is planned to have them put on display in the Palazzo della Rovere in the future five-star hotel um, for season. But the theater structures, uh, both for conservating reasons and for the statics of the buildings, will be filled in, of course, having uh, them surveyed carefully with 3D models, so this will be made accessible to everyone. So uh, hopefully they will allow uh, the people also in the hotel to enjoy the findings, and uh, this is uh, uh, what will happen for the great Jubilee year of 2025. So I thank you so much for uh, being with me uh, during this presentation and uh, I hope uh, that uh, uh, you will have the opportunity to join more context conversation. I will have uh, uh, tomorrow one talking about uh, the archaeology on the stage, what's new in Rome. We will be talking about the place where Julius Caesar was assassinated, about the news in the Colosseum. So uh, this will be an interesting update. And uh, of course, uh, I hope to have whet your appetite to come visit Rome in person. Again, thank you so much to be with me and arrivederci.